Machines helping humans, helping machines. Welcome, David. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is David Orban and uh, for me these opportunities of being uh, at these conferences are always not only uh, a pleasure uh, but also the beginning of new conversations. And that is why I am showing you my WeChat code, please help me, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, you will have potentially other questions and that we can continue the conversation uh, after the conference as well. Um, I uh, have 168 slides to go through in 15 minutes. Not true. I cut a lot of slides uh, for respecting our wonderful simultaneous translators. I would like us to give a hand and thank them because they are doing a wonderful job. Thank you very much. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today uh, is how uh, in the forthcoming Internet of Things, uh, the challenges of the localization industry are going to be very interesting and they will be completely new challenges uh, compared to before. I am also recording my presentation on video as well as uh, I will be uploading it and uh, also uploading my slides. So uh, feel free to uh, just refer to uh, your favorite search engine to find that afterwards. All of this is going to uh, be based on the understanding that exponential change is driving today's world. Uh, what is happening in the world is due to the fact that the power of our computer is increasing. Every 18 months, according to Moore's law, uh, we are going to be able to buy a cheaper and more powerful mobile phone. However, we are only 7 billion people on the planet, and the electronics industry wants to keep selling what they are producing. And this is a very simple economic reason for the birth of the Internet of Things. Because as the power of exponential change keeps growing and growing and growing, we are going to enter a very new era of unexpected consequences. My company, DOSAB, is specialized in online video captioning and translation. And we leverage the power of this exponential change. Uh, our client, YouTube, releases periodically updates to uh, their statistics of what uh, is the rate of uploads uh, of the video. And these are staggering numbers. And I am sure that for local video platforms like Yuku uh, and Tulu, uh, these numbers are similar and exploding really. So one of the latest data points is 72 hours of video are uploaded on YouTube every minute. And Cisco is also releasing incredible statistics. 90% uh, of the global internet traffic on the consumer side, according to Cisco, is going to be dedicated to video this year. And the reason is very simple. We are human, and video allows a very powerful emotional connection, even if we are not sharing the same physical space. However, videos are a black box for search engines. It is very hard for a search engine to understand what is going on within a video, and even more, whether your video is in Chinese, or your video is in English, or any other language, only a fraction of a global audience is going to be able to understand what is the original language of that video. So that is why we are partnering with people like Kay Koplovitz, who is the founder of uh, the cable industry in the United States, together with Ted Turner, and we are creating 
uh, interesting mm -hmm. ventures uh, specialized in uh, vertical fields like Vidium, which uh, is in the vertical field of health and pharma, uh, providing access to information in innovative ways. The changes around us do not occur simultaneously all over the planet. As we build our global civilization going from the pyramids in the Egyptian times to maybe the Middle Ages in the Industrial Revolution, and today our globally connected world, technology is key. And we are having, uh, we have to understand that hardware, software, and design go hand in hand. And the generations of mutual solutions are what are designing the exponentials. Whether it is vacuum cubes, integrated circuits of successive generations, or even today, now we are about to enter the age of quantum computing, we have to leverage the new platforms. When computers were born, they were blind. And that they couldn't understand, they couldn't even remember anything from one day to another. When you turn them off, they forgot everything, and they had to start from scratch, and you had to feed them your punch cards again. And then, little by little, computers started to acquire memory, and then they started to understand the world. The desktop metaphor told computers what were documents, and what were folders, and how we organize information, and that we like color, we like aesthetics, because we are aesthetical animals. And when the touch interfaces arrived, they decoupled the power of computers to understand the world from the limitations and the constraints of the human hand. And we are now giving computers sight so that they can understand our gestures and our emotions. And we have given computers the ability to hear and to understand our words. And things are not stopping there because already computers are starting to understand our thoughts. Every object is going to be smart. There is no object that is not going to have these kinds of senses because the cost of adding these two objects is exponentially decreasing but the value that derives from them is huge. And the old paradigm of separated, isolated, hierarchical, centralized organizations is being replaced by a new paradigm of networks and interconnected, distributed and decentralized organizations. The consequence of this is that whether you are in New York, like it is our case where DOTSUP's headquarters are, or whether you are, as we are together with you uh, today in Shanghai, the challenges we are facing and the opportunities that we can build together are very, very similar, regardless of where you are in the planet. When I talk to audiences like you, recently I was the keynote speaker at Cisco's Internet of Everything event, which is a worldwide event that they, they, they hold. What I talk about is how these changes are designing threads and understanding around the world and how the machines that are going to be composing the Internet of Everything in nodes need to be very different. How they are designed, deployed, and managed, they have to be totally autonomous. It is easy to understand why. You already have to charge your phone. You already have to move the pictures from your phone to the computer. You already have to update the operating system and the different computations. 
and maybe install and update and monitor your antivirus software and everything else. Even though we only have maybe a half a dozen smart objects around us, it is already a chore. And when we will have not a half a dozen, but maybe a hundred objects per person in any environment, they will have to be very, very silent. We will don't want to hear from them ever. Anything they do, anything they decide will have to be done by their own. We will want to live our own life, and they will have to live their life. There are already examples of this kind of change. Very popular robotic vacuum cleaners that are going around in rooms cleaning them do not need us to recharge them. Because very simply, they remember where the charging station is, and when they need it, they go back and recharge themselves. The conversations that are going on on WeChat are mostly amongst people. But I visited Shenzhen uh, on Friday, and I saw the showroom of Internet of Things prototypes and products by the hundreds of next generation WeChat nodes that are going to constitute conversations amongst machines. And I met the former CTO of Tencent yesterday, who confirmed that they are building a platform for machines to start using what used to be an effort for people to talk to each other. This is similar to what is happening, for example, with the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, where people don't see the data and don't touch the data. Machines decide what should be done with it. And an important example for my next session is the robotic car, which sees and perceives everything necessarily, but the decisions that the robotic car makes are very important for the lives of people. So, when you enter a room where there are hundreds of computers that are more powerful than each or maybe all of the computers in this room put together, what happens? Since we know that they have to be very, very silent, they cannot say anything to us. They have to be very aware of not only what we explicitly tell them, but we have to be very aware of also our emotional state. They have to be able to read us, whether we are happy, whether we are sad, whether we are in a hurry, and they have to be able to make decisions based on that. Last year, there was an experiment that became uh, known that uh, important social network was running. And this experiment here is an outrage because it became more uh, visible to everybody that computers not only are reading our emotions, computers are also writing our emotions. They are programming our behavior and they are learning to do it better and better. So, the challenge of the localization industry is to really work together with engineers, with designers, with hardware and software developers, because of the assumption that there are universals in emotional expression and emotional reaction are false. Just like we have separate languages, and these languages express nuances importantly 
in a different manner. The so imagine just a thought experiment where your smartwatch, as you enter a room, tells your calendar that your heartbeat is higher than usual. And your calendar responds to the smartwatch, of course, he has an appointment with his boss in 15 minutes. And then they agree to alert your music player to start playing some song that is soothing. And they realize together the three of them that it is actually fine. Your heartbeat is decreasing, you are acquiring a calm state, and when the call with your boss arrives, since the voice recognition system is continuously running, they understand that the call is going very well. However, as innocuous or positive as this example might look, things are not obviously that simple. When machines start to think and outcompete humans, as IBM's supercomputer called Watson did, beating the best human players ever in the first game a couple of years ago, or when Google's DeepMind plays video games better than any human could, not by being told what to do, but by learning totally on its own. Or when a robotic car has to decide who should live or who should die in an accident, when somebody necessarily will, it is only a question whether to swerve to the left or swerve to the right, but somebody will suffer. These are decisions of good and bad that have to be made. And today, there is not enough of a global conversation what it means to create a science of morality that must precede an engineering of morality. These machines cannot make decisions without those conversations happen. And obviously, we cannot let them make decisions without us also agreeing with what are the criteria for them. And you, as protagonists of the localization industry, understand that the world is not black and white. A single moral system, a single way of living, is not what we want. That would mean that there is a global planetary dictatorship. What we want is tolerance and inclusivity and understanding of the differences. And this is the challenge that the localization industry has to face together with the engineers, together with the scientists, to create machines that help us not only artificial intelligence, AI, but also intelligence organization, IA. Because a thousand, a hundred thousand years ago, when we decided to start to use fire, we started merging with technology. And that decision fundamentally changed us. That is the decision that we are following through with. Today, we are trying to find solutions to our challenges. Innovating, inventing new ways of analyzing the world. And we cannot go back. This is how we adapt to the new conditions by adopting new technologies. And today, the distance from having a great idea to going to market with a product that embodies this idea is going to zero. With really unbounded opportunities 
几乎没有了。我们都拥有无限的机遇，所以我给大家提出的挑战就是：如果大家希望的话，回到办公室，问你自己，你在未来